So a um, little background about Greta. Um, she um, uh, got her undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I guess maybe didn't like the snow that much and came down to the University of South Florida where she's been here since 2016. Uh, and uh, so uh, again, she's, uh, she's got a fairly extensive background in, in marine ecology and, and certainly worked a lot uh, in terms of the Gulf of Mexico research that we have ongoing. I wanted to show a few, uh, a few slides about Greta's time here. So, so one of the things about graduate students that is always a mystery to us is that you know picking graduate students is sort of like a box of chocolates. You never really know what you're going to get. And certainly this is the case in terms of, of Greta. And, and none of us really knew what her skills and interests were other than having an impressive academic record. So when she got here, we quickly found out that she really likes life at sea. And she has, has a very good time at it. Now, I'm not sure who's smiling more here, the shark or her. <laughs> um, I do question the Wisconsin ball cap, but nevertheless, um, uh, maybe we can get you to wear a USF ball cap. <laughs> but you know, Greta also brings a lot of different skills. And, and one of the things that I had asked her to do uh, as a bonus project uh, over and above her thesis research was to work on um, the growth of the red hind, which is a small grouper that we caught in abundance off the floor of, of, of Cuba. And so um, we were able to get that work done, and she um, was so successful at it that she was able to actually present that work in Havana. And so this is a, a picture of um, the, the, the people that attended that meeting, and also uh, Rita Colwell, who many of you know is a very eminent biologist. She was able to meet her there. So one of the things that, that we did in our Cuba trip was we had a cultural immersion experience. And so, um, so uh, Greta was part of that experience, and I wanted to just share a little bit of that with you. So, so this is Greta. <laughs> called, if you're a Latin music fan, this is called the Buena Vista Soul. <laughs> So the drummer calls her up. So we, we have basically dinner at the edge of the stage. So the drummer calls her up thinking, well, I'm just going to play with you know, the green person that's there, right? So this is a follow the leader kind of thing.
as it turns out, Greta was in the young <laughs> of the Egan High School of Drunk. Where'd you get that picture? <laughs> the internet is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Not only was she in the drum corps, she was in the state champion drum corps. So, like I say, you never know what you're going to get. So, with that introduction, I'm going to give it back to Greta to give her presentation. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greta Helmuller, and today I will be presenting on my master's thesis, which is about population demographics of golden tilefish in the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm first going to give a little bit of a background into why we decided to study golden tilefish, and then I'll talk about our sampling methods, as well as our data processing and data analysis. And then I'll go into results. So I have three different sections of my thesis here. And the first section, section A, is a little bit different than sections B and C. So I'm going to talk about my conclusions after section A. And then I'm going to wait until after I get done with B and C to talk about final conclusions. So golden tilefish are also referred to as tilefish. I'll be using both interchangeably throughout this presentation. Their depth range is from 26 to 457 meters, although most of the fish that we caught were around 200 to 300 meters. They have a ma maximum longevity of around 40 years, so they're very long-lived. <clears throat> their spawning season is from January to June, and their geographic range is from Nova Scotia to Venezuela in the Atlantic, as well as throughout the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico, including where the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. So the oil spill happened from April 20th of 2010 to July 15th of 2010, so about 87 days. During that time, 4.9 million barrels of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico, which is bad news for the fish because one of the more toxic components of crude oil, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, is very toxic to marine life. So it's been associated with cardiac abnormalities in fish, immune suppression, liver lesions, decreased condition, and declining growth and mortality, which is what I'll be looking at. So I decided to study tilefish because they have a long lifespan. So this is an age frequency of the fish that we caught throughout the seven years of our study. And most of the fish that we caught were around eight to 10 years old and even older than that. So all of our samples were alive when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. Additionally, they are known for digging these large burrows in the sediment. And since a lot of the oil from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill ended up sequestered in the sediment, we figured that this fish that spends most of its time bioturbating that area might be more affected than other species from the oil. And since they spend most of their time in these burrows, a lot of their prey is benthic associated and also spends a lot of time bioturbating these little holes here. And so, large holes, sorry. <laughs> and so we figured that they're not only exposed from their environments, but also from their food source. And we also have evidence of high PAH levels in tilefish. So Susan Snyder's research has looked at PAH levels in tilefish throughout the Gulf of Mexico. And this is a graph from her research. You can see that the PAH levels are much higher for tilefish than any other species of fish that we caught during our study. They also have a high lesion frequency, and tilefish are part of a larger study of impacts on oil exposure. So, like I mentioned, Susan Snyder's research concerns PAHs, and Christina Deek looks at biomarkers and genetics in tilefish and how they were impacted by oil, and Dr. Shannon O'Leary at Texas A&M Corpus Christi also looks at population connectivity and tilefish. So my goal for my thesis was to establish a baseline for golden tilefish population demographics across the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico and analyze any potential impacts from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So I set out to do this in three different parts. 
First, I looked at differences in population demographics by country of capture. Then I looked at differences in population demographics by proximity to Deepwater Horizon oil. So I compared fish that were caught in the area where the oil spill happened to fish from all other US sites. And finally, I compared that grouping of fish that were caught after the spill from the area of the Deepwater Horizon spill to fish that were caught before the spill from the same area. Moving on to methods, most of our after spill sampling was done on board the RV Weatherbird 2 here. And we used a demersal long line system. So for those of you who might not be familiar, First, one long line was laid out. It's about five miles long with around 400 to 500 hooks per set. And it's just a very effective way of sampling lots of demersal fish. Then the boat would turn around and go back to the line to ensure roughly equal soak time for each hook. And our fish would come up and take the bait. And then we collect the samples and the hooks back onto the boat for analysis. <clears throat> so once we got the fish on the boat, <laughs> First, we would take weight and length measurements. So the main one that I use in my thesis is fork length, which is the length from the tip of the fish here to the smallest part of the tail. But we also took total length and standard length measurements for these fish. We collected bile, muscle, liver, eye lenses for those other 12 fish studies that I mentioned earlier. But the sample that most concerns my study were otoliths. So otoliths are the ear bones of the fish. They're used in both hearing and sensor or spatial awareness in fish. They're found behind the head here. And each fish has six otoliths, three on each side. So we just extracted the largest one here, the one that's labeled SEG. Because once you take an otolith and section it using a Bueller isomet saw like this one, and look at the sections under a microscope. You can count the rings, kind of like the rings of a tree, to figure out how old the fish was when it died. So these white dots represent what we determined to be the annual rings in the fish. And one thing that some of you who might have aged fish before might notice is that the bands are a lot thicker in golden tile fish. So this is one of the caveats of our study. The thickness of the bands is determined by growth periods in a fish's life. So during really slow growth periods, the bands are, little layers of the otolith are deposited very close together, and you'll see a thicker, opaque band. Whereas during high growth periods, which are usually during the summer when temperatures are warm, the bands are parted further apart. <clears throat> so tilefish live very deep, like I said, around 200 to 300 meters, and so they don't experience the same seasonal variation in temperature that other fish do. And so, in this study, we have a little bit more uncertainty with our ages because they are so hard to age using this method. So, all fish ages were determined twice by me. I acted as the first and second reader. And just to make sure I knew what I was doing, 100 fish ages were determined by Dr. Linda Lombardi, our tilefish expert. <clears throat> the average percent error between my ages and her ages was 8.4%, which is pretty standard for something that's very hard to age, like a tilefish. And the average percent error between my ages and Linda's ages was 10%. So now I'm going to go into data analysis. And like I mentioned, there were three separate sections of my thesis. So I used the same statistical methods and graphing modeling techniques to analyze variation in each of these three sections. And for each three section, I was comparing two groups of fish. So for my first section, country capture, my groupings were our fish that were caught in the USA compared to our fish that were caught in Mexico. For my second grouping, my, or my second section, my groupings were fish that were caught from the area of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill compared to fish that were caught from all other US sites. And then finally, for my third section, my groupings were fish that were caught before the oil spill compared to fish that were caught from the area of the oil spill afterwards. So when I talk about groups, like this is what I'm referring to in each case. So first I wanted to know if there was a difference in size structure. So in order to do that, I graphed something called an empirical cumulative distribution function. So graphed it'll look something like this with fork length on the x-axis and cumulative proportion on the y-axis. So at one here, 100% of fish are at this fork length or less. 
And the resulting lines will look something like this. So in order to test for differences in size structure, we test for differences in these two curves here. And I accomplished that using a KS test. So a KS test can detect differences in location, shape, and dispersion of those two lines. And so if there's a p-value of less than 0.05, that means that the size structures are different between our two groupings. Next, I looked at differences in the late weight relationship between my two groupings. <clears throat> so graph data looks something like this, with fork length on the x-axis and total weight on the y-axis. And the resulting regressions against the raw data will look something like this. And it can be described by the following equation, where w is equal to weight and l is equal to length. And then these alpha and beta are just graphing parameters. So in order to tell if there's a difference in the length-weight relationship, which is related to growth of the fish, we want to test for differences in these two parameters. So in order to do that, <clears throat> I log-transformed the length-weight relationship, which graphed will look something like this. So now there's a linear relationship between log of length and log of weight. And that beta parameter becomes the slope. And so to test for differences in slope, I used Anna and Kova. And if there is a p-value less than 0.05, that means that that beta parameter differs, which means that there's a difference in the length-weight relationship between our two groupings. Next, I looked at condition factors. So their uh, proxy for fish physical health it is, assumes that fish that are heavier for their size are necessarily healthier. And it can be impacted by changes in feeding or environmental variables. And we test for differences in means using a t-test. So I use two condition factors. The first is called Fulton's condition factor, which just compares weight and length. And it's the most commonly used condition factor in fishery science. Then I use relative condition factor, which compares the actual weight of the fish to the predicted weight of the fish. Next, I looked at von Bertha lengthy growth curves. So it's a measure of length at age in a fish. So graphed it'll look something like this, which aid with age on the x-axis and fork length on the y-axis. The resulting curves will appear something like this. And it can be described by this equation up here. So that LP is equal to fork length at a time t, with t being the age of the fish. And the other three letters are graphing parameters. So L infinity is equal to the maximum mean length of the fish. So it's the asymptote of this curve here. K is equal to how quickly that function approaches L infinity. So it's not exactly a growth rate, but sometimes it's interpreted like a growth rate, even though it's technically not. And T0 is just the x-intercept of this graph. It doesn't really have a biological interpretation because it's supposed to represent the time at which length is equal to 0, which doesn't actually exist in the wild. So in order to test for differences, I used a uh, likelihood ratio test to find any significant differences in these parameters. And to verify the results of the likelihood ratio test, I used AIC and BIC model selection. <clears throat> so for the likelihood ratio test, what I'm looking at are differences in models. So in this case, a model is just a set of two equations. One equation which describes the growth in group one, and one equation that describes the growth in group two. And throughout this test, my goal is to find the, fewest number of the model where the fewest number of parameters differ between those two equations and the data is adequately explained. So just as a reminder, these are my groupings. So when I talk about group one and group two, that'll be these variables throughout my thesis. <clears throat> so first, I create a model where I combine group one and group two together, and I generate one equation to describe the growth in both groups. And I compare that to a model where the groups are fit separately. So we have different parameters for each grouping. I run the test, I get a chi-squared value. And if the chi-squared p-value is greater than 0.05, then we're done. That means that the variation can be adequately described with this first model here. And we know that there's no difference in growth because there's no statistically significant difference in these parameters. However, if it's less than 0.05, then we need to move on to the next step. So let's say in this case that that was our result. <clears throat> so then I compare these three models where I hold one parameter constant between the two equations 
And I compare that to our original best model where both equations are fit separately and we have different parameters describing the growth in each. So again, whatever model has the highest log likelihood value and a chi-squared p-value that's greater than 0.05 is our new best model because it's not statistically different than this one, so it adequately describes the data, but it's a more parsimonious model, so we know that whatever parameter can be fit between both of them is not statistically significantly different. So if it's number two in this case, we know that this k parameter does not differ between our two groupings, but we still want to know if there's a differ difference in L infinity or T0. <clears throat> so the next step is to hold both L infinity and K constant for our first model and just vary T0, and then just vary L infinity for our second model and keep K and T0 constant. We compare that to our new best model where K is held constant, and again, try to find the model with the highest log likelihood value and a chi squared p-value greater than 0 0.05. So if it's model number two in this case, that means that we know that there is a significant difference in the L infinity parameter. So <clears throat> if we actually look at that difference on a graph here, uh, we can see that the x-intercept is pretty much the same between these two lines. So we know that T0 does not differ. The two lines approach the asymptote at around the same rate, which again would signify that K is the same. But the curves are kind of stacked on top of each other, which would signify a difference in L infinity. Finally, I looked at catch curves. <clears throat> so graph data looks something like this, with age on the x-axis and ln of catch on the y-axis. The resulting curves will resemble something like this, and we only care about the descending limb of the slope here. So the slope of the descending limb is equal to a parameter called z, which is the total instantaneous mortality rate. It doesn't have a very good biological interpretation on its own, but Z can be used to find the annual mortality rate, which is the percentage of fish that are undergoing mortality in any given year. So since we're looking for differences in slope, I used an ANCOVA to test for differences. And if a p-value is less than 0.05, that means that the mortalities are significantly different. So moving on into the results. <clears throat> So like I said, my first question here is whether there's any difference in population demographics between the fish that we caught in the United States and the fish that we caught in Mexico. So looking for difference in size structure, the chaos test was significantly different, which means there's a difference in size structure. Uh, so looking at the graph here for interpretation, let's say that this is the 50% line. So 50% of fish from Mexico are at around 59 centimeters or less, whereas 50% of fish from the USA are at around 52 centimeters or less. So we know then that the Mexican tilefish size distribution is larger than our size distribution for tilefish from the USA. Moving on into the length-weight relationship. So the ANCOVA was not significant, which means that there is no significant difference in that beta parameter in the length-weight relationship between USA and Mexico tilefish. And that can be verified by this graph. Like The regression lines practically overlap. <clears throat> Next, looking at condition factor. So a t-test was significant, which means there's a significant difference in condition between our US and our Mexico tilefish. So looking at the graph, you can see that the mean condition factor was a lot higher in the USA than it was in Mexico which would signify that our tilefish from the USA are on average in better condition than our tilefish from Mexico. Oh, crap. <laughs> uh, moving ahead to our viral lampy curve. <clears throat> the likelihood ratio test found that the only significant difference was in K, and ASC and BSC model selection found that the difference was in L infinity, but the, lowest AIC, the second lowest AIC and BIC values were for the model where K differs. So this was a little unexpected, <clears throat> and there could be several possibilities contributing to this. So it's possible that there is a difference in L infinity that wasn't being picked up in this likelihood ratio test, but looking at the graphs here, like you can see that the percent confidence intervals are a lot larger for our Mexican tilefish than they are for our USA tilefish. 
<clears throat> so that could have affected the statistical significance of things. Um, the model requires a large age spread, and we didn't have that many old tilefish from Mexico. So it's a lot more uncertain in this older age, and you know, that could be a reason why the model was not selected. So the Mexican tilefish may have a higher mean maximum length, and they may approach it faster than our tilefish from the USA. Finally, looking at mortality, so the ANCOVA was statistically significant, and as you can see, the slope is a lot greater for our Mexican tilefish than for our USA tilefish, and the annual mortality rate is about 10% higher for our Mexican fish, which is surprising. So what does this all mean? <clears throat> so our tilefish from Mexico are longer, and they may grow faster, although we're unsure if the model was fit correctly. Our USA tilefish are in better condition and have a lower annual mortality rate. So there are a couple factors that could contribute to this. One thing that people or fishery scientists look at first is gear type. So if you have different gear and you're selecting for different sizes of fish and you might see a difference when there really is none. But we use the same gear across all of our samples so we know it's not that. Another influence could be temperature at capture. So like I mentioned earlier, growth tends to be slower during the winter, during low temperatures for fish, and higher during the summer when temperatures are higher. <clears throat> but this is data from the lines themselves. So we had sensors on the long line to detect depth at capture and temperature at capture. And in this 200 to 300 range here, you can see that temperatures are almost exactly the same. So we know it's not due to temperature. Uh, fishing pressure could be something that also influences growth and mortality. So fishing mortality is part of total mortality. So if there's higher mortality, that could signify a difference in fishing. And we have some fishing data from the US and Mexico. Uh, it seems to be consistently higher in the US, although our data from Mexico is self-reported and it combines all tile fish species together. So it's not quite as accurate as our USA tilefish landings. So there could still be a difference there, but we're just, from what we have right now, we can't say that. Finally, productivity could be influencing the differences in condition that we saw. So when there's higher primary productivity, there's usually higher condition for the fish because they weigh more. And this is a map of primary productivity in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see that's a lot higher in the northern gulf than it is in the southern gulf. And so that could be a reason why we're seeing that difference in condition between the northern and southern tilefish. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on to my second section, which was concerning proximity to deep water horizon oil. So my deep water horizon sites are these ones here. And if you overlay a map of the spill, they are squarely in the center of where the oil was distributed right after the spill. And our all other US sites are just the other sites that we found in the United States as a control group. So the chaos test was insignificant, which means that there is no difference in size structure between our Deepwater Horizon group and our all other US sites group. So looking at the length weight relationship, <clears throat> again, the ANCOVA was not significant. So in this length weight relationship, we know that it doesn't differ between our Deepwater Horizon group and our other group in that beta parameter. Looking at condition factors, so the Welch's t-test was significant, so there's a significant difference in condition. And it turns out that our group of fish from the area of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill are in better condition than our fish from elsewhere in the US, which was surprising. <laughs> but I'll come back to this a little bit later after I talk about the third section. Next, going ahead to the Von Bertalampi curves. So our likelihood ratio test and AIC and BIC model selection found that the difference was in both L infinity and K. So the asymptote of the curve for our deep water horizon grouping is a lot higher than for our other US sites grouping. 
So our deepwater horizon tilefish have a higher mean maximum length, but approach it at a slower rate than are all other U.S. sites grouping. Finally, looking at mortality for this group, the ANCOVA was significant, and again, you can see there's a pretty large difference in the size of these two curves. And once again, the annual mortality rate was about 10% higher for our Deepwater Horizon group than our all other U.S. sites group, which, once again, I'll come back to later after I talk about our comparisons of fish caught from the same area before the Deepwater Horizon sill versus fish caught afterwards. So our before data comes from the National Marine Fishery Service, and it's a combination of both fishery dependent and independent data. And our ages were, again, aged by Dr. Linda Lombardi here. <clears throat> so the size distribution is significantly different between our before group and our after group. And from looking at the curve here, again, it's kind of conceptually backwards, but this curve that's underneath the other one has the larger size structure. So our fish that were caught pre-spill tend to be larger than our fish caught post-spill, although these lines are very close together. So even if there is a statistically significant difference, it's probably not a very large one. So our ANCOVA on the length-weight relationship was not significant. So there's no difference in that beta parameter between our pre-spill tilefish and our post-spill tilefish. Moving ahead to relative condition factor, so the Welch's t-test that I did was significant, which means that our pre-spill tilefish are in worse condition than our post-spill tilefish, which again is surprising. But. Uh, moving ahead to von Bertalampi growth, <clears throat> so the likelihood ratio test and the AIC model selection found that the difference was in L infinity and T0, but the BIC model selection found that the only difference was in T0. So BIC model selection tends to favor models with fewer parameters differing, so it's possible that this is a false positive and that the real difference is in both L infinity and T0. But again, the difference does not appear to be very strong. Like looking at the curves here, the 95% confidence intervals overlap very well. And for this curve, we can attribute some of the difference to differences in aging. So this, is, this grouping is the only group where there were two different agers. So like I said, Linda Lombardi aged all the fish. And so <clears throat> there might be a higher mean maximum length, but it's also possible that there are some aging discrepancies causing that. Finally, looking at mortality, so our ANCOVA was insignificant, and again, looking at this curve here, these lines are practically parallel, and the annual mortality rate is very similar between our pre-spill fish and our post-spill fish. So there's no difference in mortality between these two groupings. So what does this all mean? <clears throat> So condition factors were higher in our Deepwater Horizon tilefish grouping that were caught from around the site of the spill and caught after the spill from that same site. So what that tells us is that the effect of oil exposure on condition factors is either not as strong as we would expect, like there could be other influences on condition factors in that area that are keeping condition high even though oil exposure would theoretically lower condition for those fish. Or it could be that the effect is just not as expected. And the differences in growth and mortality that we saw for our Deepwater Horizon tile fish are not associated with the Deepwater Horizon spill. So again, looking at these differences in mortality, like you would think, just looking at this curve, that the oil exposure was causing a much higher mortality in this deep water horizon fish, but the mortalities are pretty much exactly the same between our before and after grouping. So whatever's impacting mortality in that area, it's not associated with the area where it was caught in relation to the deep water horizon spill. So <clears throat> future work that could be done on this project. So if I were to continue on with this project, I would want a larger spread of area ages from Mexico so I could look at differences in the sub areas. So we only had about 140 fish from Mexico. And with making von Bertolampi curves and such, you need a 
pretty wide spread of ages. Like we already saw that there were some issues in determining the L infinity parameter because we didn't quite have enough old Mexican tilefish to make a great model. And we definitely don't have enough of an age spread in our different sub areas to also look at those differences. I would also want to sample a uh, longer time after the Deepwater Horizon spill date. <clears throat> so all the fish that we caught were already adults at the time of the Deepwater Horizon spill. Like I said, like they were around eight to 10 years old or older. And since we sampled up to seven years after the spill, we didn't catch any fish or many fish that were eggs or larvae at the time of the spill. So oil exposure can have a detrimental effect on eggs and larvae in fish. And so it'd be interesting to have another group of tilefish that were caught 10 to 15 years later to see that if there's any differences in these big population level demographics when those fish that were spawned at the time of the spill are adults. Finally, I would look and see if there are other biological or physical processes that are impacting these differences. So like I said, we don't quite know why condition is higher in our fish that were caught around the site of the Deepwater Horizon spell. But if we were to look at what could be impacting that, we might have a more complete story to tell of that area. So first off, I would like to thank my committee Steve Borowski, Chris Stallings, and the Lombardi. Uh, special shout out to Linda for driving all the way down from Panama City for this and for teaching me how to age tilefish. Um, I want to thank the entire Murawski lab, um, especially those of you who came to my practice defense and gave me advice. Thank you so much. Um, special shout out to Susan for listening to my defense three times now <laughs> <laughs> and for helping me understand the PAH stuff. Um, I'd like to thank the larger CMS community, so everybody that helped me prepare for this and just was friends with me. <laughs> um, these three years went by so fast, and I love you guys so much. Um, I want to thank my boyfriend, Stephen Brandt, for listening to this talk more than anybody <laughs> and for like keeping me sane this week. Thank you so much. I love you. And then I want to thank my parents, um, my mom, who couldn't be here today and my dad, who came all the way down from Minnesota to watch my talk. Um, like, fishing with you is what got me interested in this, and like, thank you for sparking that in me. And I would also like to thank all these people <laughs> for data collection. <laughs> Everybody who helped us, I mean, you know, sampling is a lot of work, and we had a lot of manpower, and thank you to everybody for that. Mm-hmm.